Father, thank you for the night, and God, I just thank you for your word. God, your word is just yes, it is true, it is amen. And God, I thank you for this study in Jonah that we are having. And uh, Lord, I just know, you know, we all struggle at times with calls, uh, Lord, just with life sometimes. And to think of a prophet of God, you know, running like that, uh, and, you know, even Paul writing in Romans chapter 7, uh, it's encouraging to know that uh, they were just human like us. And God, the, the word was written uh, to us and to Christians. And God, I pray that we can just uh, glean from the word and uh, see how we need to change sometimes. God, just thank you for just a beautiful day you've given us. Thank you for the church body. Uh, Lord, thank you for Marty and Brother Paul preaching Sunday. And God, it's so good to know that uh, when I'm not here, uh, everything is in good hands. So God bless our Bible study tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Jonah chapter 2. Uh, we have, uh, did last, last week, uh, we did Jonah 1, and if you see a pattern here, we'll do 1, 2, and 3. Uh, we'll do a Bible study in each a week till we get through the book of Jonah. You know, after running from God, admitting to the captain of the ship that he was the problem, being thrown overboard into the sea, being swallowed by a huge fish, three days and three nights in the belly of a whale, Jonah had a change of attitude and a change of heart. He had thought being thrown into the sea would be a death sentence, but God gave him three days and three nights to think about things. Jonah had to stink like a fish, must have been exhausted from treading water. He thought he was going to die, uh, but yet God showed mercy on him. Jonah finally realized uh, he was still alive for some reason. Uh, he truly had a come-to-Jesus meeting uh, and realized his attitude towards God and the people of Nineveh were wrong. Uh, Jonah truly had a change of heart. So let's look at Jonah chapter 2, verse 1. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, uh, his God, from the fish's belly. And again, two things stick out in that first verse to me. Number one, he prayed. Uh, folks, prayer is so important to a Christian. Uh, it's even more important to a growing Christian. And even though Jonah had rebelled against God and uh, basically went against God's will uh, in the belly of the whale, he, he realized that he had done wrong. So he knew what to do. Folks, he was a prophet of God. He, he knew what it was like to sense the presence of God. Uh, he knew what it was like to, uh, to hear from God and uh, to minister to people. Uh, but yet, in this part of his life, in this season or this, this time, uh, he made bad choices, but he knew what to do. He began in prayer. And notice the word, he prayed to the Lord his God. He knew the right God. There were many gods out there, just as in today, little G's, uh, but he, he knew God, Jehovah of the Bible, and he prayed from the fish's belly. And <laughs> I'm just telling you folks, I can't imagine being in a fish's belly for three days and three nights. That's just unheard of. Matter of fact, you know, there are people, you know, and I would not say Bible scholars, but, uh, you know, there are some who believe this is a parable or this is just a story and it actually didn't happen. Uh, but I truly believe, uh, you know, it was, it, it is true. Matter of fact, I thought about this as I was studying even last week. Uh, you know, it, truly wasn't the guys, the sailors that threw him overboard. I know physically they did that, but it was God. God with, you know, the, the you know, lots and, you know, the situation there. He was the one that had him thrown overboard. And if you are thrown overboard in a churning sea, folks, the, the chances of your survival are not good. So even at that, he was under the discipline of God, and God did it uh, for a specific reason, uh, and that reason was uh, because he was not following the will of God. Then he cried out to the Lord 
because then I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. What's the first step? Admitting it, folks. We have to admit it. The word I used when I was a youth minister was admit it and quit it. You can admit it, but if you don't quit it, then nothing's going to change. And so he owned it. And, and folks, we as Christians have the Holy Spirit to tell us, you know, uh, you know, when we are doing wrong. Even though he had a hate for the Assyrians, he did not want to go to Nineveh. He hid and was running from God. Uh, you know, he realized what he did was wrong, and he realized that it was his own fault. Too many times in life we blame others for our own sin, okay? And we don't need to do that, folks. Uh, we need to own it and, and repent. And, you know, repentance, uh, it's a word that I just don't hear that much uh, in preaching uh, anymore. Repentance is so important. And, folks, to repent, the first thing you have to do is pray. Repentance starts with prayer. Repentance start with an honest look with God, an honest look towards God, and an honest look at your own life. You can't repent if you don't admit it. So we need to admit it and quit it. And then repentance, in short, is a sincere confession. Okay, And you've heard me say this many times in our ministry here. You know, when you do something wrong, there's three phrases that you need to say. God, I was wrong. That's the first thing you need to say. The second thing you need to say is, God, I'm sorry. Admit it. I'm sorry. And the third thing you need to say, God, please forgive me. That's what true repentance is. And even, you know, uh, sometimes people, uh, again, I go back to youth ministry, uh, they can say the word, you know, uh, youth can say, well, I'm sorry. Like when somebody does something wrong and you, and kids are really bad about that, children, tell them you're sorry. I'm sorry. You know, they're not meaning it. They're sorry that they got caught. But when true repentance comes into our lives, folks, it changes our attitude and it changes our heart. It's saying, God, it's my fault. I'm sorry, would you please forgive me? Out of the belly of Shiloh, I cried. And, and again, we know that was the holding place back in the Old Testament. Uh, and I think, you know, it, it was like hell in a belly swell. I can't imagine the juices, okay, that stuff that, that digests things and just floating around there with other stinking fish, you know, and, it, you know, it, it was a traumatic thing in Jonah's life. And you heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and the flood surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. And if he had stayed in the ocean long enough, folks, he would have drowned. I mean, a person can only tread water for so long. And so I think he realized what bad shape he was in and how serious God was. And it says, verse 4, Then I said, I've been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again to your holy temple. And the out of sight, of course, we're never out of God's sight. We're never separated from God uh, as Christians. But down in the belly's well, uh, you know, the, the whale, whale's belly, uh, he couldn't be seen. I mean, you know, there's no rescuing down there. Uh, there's no light down there. Again, the smell and the, I'm, I mean, there's, there is truly a death sentence on him. And when you think about a death sentence, because, you know, there's a, there's a scripture in 1 John I want to go to. Uh, 1 John chapter 5. Let's go there right here. I was going to do it a couple of more verses, but I'm thinking about it, so let's, I'm, I'm taking that as a Holy Spirit prompting, okay? 1 John 5, verse 16. If anyone sees his brother sinning, a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit not 
commit sin, not leading to death. And this is what was going on. Now, I think at this point in Jonah's life, he didn't know if he's going to live or die. Okay, but right now when he's confessing, all right, he is not dead. So there is a sin not unto death. Okay, and, and this is for the Christian. Okay, we're talking about the Christian. First John was written to the Christian. Matter of fact, if you go through First John, it's a great scripture to read for someone doubting their salvation. Okay, it is a great book to read. Now look at the second part of that. This is so plain. There is a sin leading to death. As a Christian, there is a sin that I'm telling you, you could die for. And I know what every, the first thing somebody says is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Well, folks, that's denying Christ. We're talking about to a Christian. But I can show you two examples in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. Okay, Jonah was under in his estimation, the sentence of death. Because even surviving three days in the belly of a whale is a miracle to me in itself. But you go back to the Old Testament, and you remember, uh, you know, uh, Achan? Achan took, I mean, God told them not to take anything, destroy these folks. You don't take any of the, the stuff. You don't take the animals. You don't take anything. And Achan hid things in his tent. Okay, and, and man, uh, they went to Ai after that. You know, they conquered Jericho, which was impregnable. I mean, it was just like, you can't conquer that, and God had the walls fall down. They go a little thing, and he says, oh, I'll only take about 2,000 men, and they were defeated. And so I'm telling you, God said there's sin in the camp. You need to take care of that. And Achan and his family and his kids and everybody uh, was, was sentenced to die there. And then we all know Acts chapter 5 in the New Testament, Ananias and Sapphira, okay, revival had broken out, people were giving things, and they lied to the Holy Spirit. That's not the same as blasphemy. Again, blasphemy is, is not believing in God. Blasphemy uh, you know, is not accepting Christ there. But yet, Ananias and Sapphira has died. And so I make that point to say, I think... It was so serious, you know, uh, his sin and his rebellion against God that Jonah really thought, you know, I'm not going to survive this. I'm just not going to survive this. Now, look at verse 4. Then I said, wait, did I finish that? I don't think I did. Was there, a, I'm getting ahead of myself. Did I? No, I didn't. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. So it's not a contradiction, folks, all right? It's saying sometimes, and obviously God is the deciding factor in that, okay? With Jonah uh, going away from God, if God wanted just to let him go, he could have just let him go. He didn't have to prepare a fish. And again, it shows the power of God, folks. He can talk to a fish and that fish will do whatever he tells them to do. So he's basically saying there is a sin unto death, and Jonah was probably skirting real close to that, but there's also a sin not unto death. Now let's go back to Jonah 2. Then I said, I've been cast out of your sight, yet well, I will look again towards your hope, uh, holy temple. What is he saying? The key word in that verse is again. So Jonah has been in worship with God. Jonah has been right with God. And folks, Satan normally don't, you know, go towards, uh, you know, solid Christians. He usually doesn't come in the front door trying to knock the door down. He just sneaks into people's lives. He does small, subtle things, all right, that, that gets them started on this spiral downward towards sin. Verse 5, the water surrounded me even to my soul, the deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. And, and again, you know, uh, one of the things I think it talks about just how uh, sin sometimes just tangles us and pulls us down. Verse 6, I went down to the moorings of the mountains. And again, that's, uh, you know, towards the bottom of the sea, uh, you know, the cracks and crevices. The earth 
with its bars closed behind me forever. So I'm just telling you folks, he is crying out to God. He is telling God, you know, I know where I am. I know what I have done. I know what you could have done. I, I have this brush with death. And, and he's saying, I am sorry. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O oh Lord, my God. You know, I, I hadn't thought of this before. It isn't neat how you, you've heard this story a thousand times if you're over 60 years old. But the thing I did not see in this before is Jonah was quoting Scripture there. So he knew Scripture. He was quoting Psalm 16, verse 10. So it's just saying that we always have to beware. We always have to check our attitude. We always have to you know, really see, am I right with God? Am I following God's will? Am I doing what God asked me to do? And he's admitting this in his own life. And you can see true repentance in Jonah's life. Psalms 32, go there with me. Psalm 32. Psalm 32 says, and this is the Psalm of David, uh, the joy of forgiveness. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. Okay? Not being, you know, sorry because you got caught. It's thanking God. Folks, I don't know about you, but I don't think I could live another day without the forgiveness of God. The forgiveness of God. 1 John 1, 9, you know that. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Blessed is he whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit. Folks, I'm telling you, if you admit it, if you are sincere, if you repent of it, even the disciples didn't understand this. You know, they had a problem with forgiveness. Hey, if somebody sins against me, how many times do I have to forgive them? Seven times? That's what the law says. Well, Jesus said, no, you're, you're adding is wrong. You need to learn to multiply. Seventy times seven. And folks, I promise you, God has forgiven you more than 400 and 90 times in your life. I promise you. Unless you are a saint. Okay, and I, you know, well, we'll just move on. <laughs> when I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. What is he talking about? He's talking about conviction. God convicts us through the Holy Spirit. And when we don't listen to that conviction, when we don't listen to the Holy Spirit, we in some ways just become numb to that. And it says, my vitality was turned into the drought of summer. And he's talking about that emptiness that's in our life, being tired, being drained, not being excited about things of God, making yourself go to church, making yourself pray, making yourself read your Bible. And that's what making peace with sin does. Verse 5, here's the key. I acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity, iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. And I believe with all my heart, this is what Jonah was doing. He was in the belly of that well, crying out to God, saying, God, I'm hearing you. I know I'm wrong. I am sorry. Please forgive me. So we see Jonah's true repentance. The second thing we see is Jonah's total restoration. Total restoration. Matter of fact, you know, when you turn your back on God, I, I thought of this and jotted this down the other day. When you turn your back on God, you will go down. D-O-W-N. And again, I'm not saying down. You know, some people, you know, refer that going to hell. That's not what I'm talking about. You will spiritually go down, okay? Jonah had been going down since he rebelled against God. Think about this. He went down to Joppa. He went down into the ship. He went down into the sea. He went down into a fish's belly. 
And this downward spiral was about to literally kill him. And folks, it's, it's like being on a slippery slope, okay? If you've ever been uh, snow skiing or if you've ever been in winters, uh, when the, the most dangerous time to snow ski is when the sun comes out and it starts melting, but it's cold enough to keep free, refreezing. And I've been at that. You'll be skiing down a hill and you'll hit that and you can literally hear ice under your skis. And when you do that, I'm telling you, you will have a hard time stopping. It is a dangerous thing. And that's what Jonah was doing. He, he was on that slippery slope and was downtrodden. Look at verse 7. When my soul fainted within me. Folks, he was exhausted. He was exhausted. I mean, mentally, physically, spiritually. I remembered the Lord. And my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. That's twice he used that phrase, holy temple. He was longing to be right with God. He was running towards God now. He was saying, God, I hear you. I understand what you're trying to teach me. God, I want to go to you. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. And again, folks, the mercy of God is not giving us what we deserve. The grace of God is what saves us, giving us what we don't deserve. And so, you know, Jonah's having this come to Jesus meeting and he's talking to the Lord. And then verse 9, but I will sacrifice you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Jonah, feeling like he couldn't go on, realized that God never forgets his people. Folks, God knows where we are. God knows what we're about. God knows how we are thinking. God knows our motives in everything we do. You're not going to fool Him. You're not going to run from Him. You're not going to hide from Him. And I'm telling you, wherever you stopped on that spiritual road, I'm, that's exactly where you will start your journey again. But God is waiting. God is loving. God is compassionate. God is merciful. And you can never get so far away from God and Jesus that you cannot come back. And Jonah, admitting it, admitting what he had done, saying, God, I'm sorry, was coming back to his heavenly Father. And know what, know what, what else? It, it began with prayer, and then it turned into thanksgiving. Folks, I, I really believe we don't thank God enough. We really don't. You just think, think, <laughs> think, think of everything God has done for you. Just salvation alone should make us well up with gratitude. Just knowing that God snatched our soul out of hell and, and, and put us uh, in, in the place so that we can go to heaven. Jonah realized in his mistake, realizing that God is forgiven him, he, he just busted out in praise and thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. And again, you know, some people took this as a sacrifice. Well, obviously you cannot sacrifice, uh, you know, in a belly swell. You just can't do that. But what I believe he was talking about there, he, he was, uh, you know, not paying that, but just saying, you know, I had this vow to you. And that vow was when I got the call to the ministry, I answered that. When I got the call to preaching, I answered that. I, I am a prophet of God. That's what a prophet did. It, it was, he, he said, thus saith the Lord. And he said, God, I believe what this means is he was renewing his vow. And there's a thing in our church that I, I'm telling you, we just, it just don't happen enough in church, and that is rededicating your life to Christ. That's what Jonah was doing. Jonah was literally, literally rededicating his life to Christ. And I know you can do it in the pews, but I truly believe in, in God knows your motive. You don't do it so somebody else will do it. But if God tells you to rededicate your life to Christ, get down here and rededicate your life to Christ. He was having this honest moment with God. 
And he was saying, man, I took a vow and I broke that vow. And God, I'm sorry. And then this statement, and, and again, this is one that just stuck out in my mind. Salvation is of the Lord. When you think about every book, 66 books in the Bible, what is the main theme of God's holy word? It's salvation. It's salvation. All through God's holy word. And that's what Jonah was saying. He sees what he's missing. He saw his mistake. And that mistake was go to Nineveh. There's no Christians there. There's no church there. They're Assyrians. They're mean. They're, they're angry. They're, they're harsh people. You go to there and you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that is a twofold thing. He was saying, God saved me. He saved him personally earlier in his life. He saved him his life, uh, you know, in this, uh, the, this fish swallowing him up. But the purpose of everything is not just that, to say, hey, there was a miracle and there was a guy in the book, book called Jonah. It's so he would get back to God's will and do what God has asked him to do. Hebrews 4. Go with me to Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, and we know that is Jesus Christ, who has passed through the heavens. Folks, he's been there, okay? He's the only one that started in heaven, came to earth, and is going back to heaven. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession, okay? Salvation, our profession of faith. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Folks, that's the difference between us and Jesus. We are tempted and we fall to temptation. Jesus, for 33 years, was tempted. He was tempted by Satan himself. Folks, he can only be at one place at one time, and I would think it would be a pretty... Solid thing to say, we, or I, maybe you don't believe it, but I, I'm not sure I've ever been Satan, uh, tempted by Satan himself. But Jesus was, and he said no to temptation. And the other thing to that, just a sideline, folks, he quoted Scripture. I cannot tell you how important Scripture is to a, to a growing Christian. Now, here's the verse I want you to see. Let us, therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace. Boldly is not arrogance here. Boldly is faith praying. Boldly is knowing who God is. Boldly is knowing that God can change any situation in our life. Boldly is giving God the credit. Okay, folks, we're just, we're just worms. Okay, we're just, I mean, God doesn't need us. He wants us. He uses us. But come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of what? Need. Folks, I'm telling you, God is always there. He is waiting for that prayer. He is waiting. And he gave Jonah total restoration. The third thing I want you to see, Jonah's complete redemption. So the Lord spoke to the fish. <laughs> That's kind of the fish whisper. Okay, God spoke to the fish and vomited Jonah into onto dry land. Can you can you imagine three days and three nights, your clothes stunk, you know, you got this goop in your hair. I mean, I think it would be a scary sight if you just happened to come on the beach that day. You'd think, what is wrong? This guy's insane. This guy's crazy. And the reason I say it was a miracle, because, folks, I don't think he could have lived much longer. As a human being, as a man, he could have lived much longer uh, there. But God, uh, you know, I mean, Jesus on the cross. And think about this, folks. The cross hadn't even begun yet. I mean, the cross hadn't even happened yet. But yet we still, in the Old Testament, they had the forgiveness of sin. Jonah, one thing I wrote down, Jonah made the fish sick enough to vomit him, okay? I mean, the fish didn't even, I mean, it was a sour belly. The second thing there, uh, but 
there's another moral to the story. You can't keep a good man down. All right, those two things I believe are true. Jonah landed on dry land, and uh, boy, I'm just telling you, God, uh, Jonah had a change of heart. Matthew chapter 12, just two more scriptures, and we're through. Matthew chapter 12, because it's kind of hid there in the book of Matthew, and some people would kind of scratch their head on and say, what is he talking about there? Uh, Look at Matthew uh, 12, verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered and said, answered saying, teacher, notice what they call him, okay, not master, not savior, not Messiah, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Well, folks, he'd already done a bunch of signs, and uh, you know, Jesus, he really got tired. People, a, lot of, a lot of people, people are human. They were following him just looking for the miracles, okay? They were hungry, and he fed 5,000 people. Folks, that's a miracle, okay? A blind men come to, and he healed them, and they were just looking for signs. And really what they, I believe, they were looking, how do you get your power? How, how can you do these things? Verse 39, but he answered and said unto them, an evil and adulterous generation seek after their sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. And he's basically saying, I'm not going to tell you, you know, I mean, he told them before, you know, I and my father are one, and they went crazy. He saw, you know, he said, you know, my power comes from heaven, you know, and they they just, you know, they called him all kinds of names and false prophet, Beelzebub, just all kinds of things. But I will give you, you know, you're you're looking for a sign. How about the sign of Jonah? Okay, why? Because these were Old Testament folks. Okay, they they were law scholars. Everyone knows the story of Jonah. Everyone. Verse 40, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. What is he talking about? He's talking about his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Folks, is that not the gospel? That is the gospel. And what he was saying is, you know, you'll look at Jonah and you'll see him as a prophet and you'll see all that as a miracle but the miracle standing right in front of you, you won't even acknowledge. And, and I think sometimes, and again, I'm not trying to put words in Jesus' mouth, you know, you don't get it. How many times have I told you this? You know, you're looking for a sign. You want me to show off or do miracles. Well, the miracle's standing right in front of you, and you will not acknowledge it. Folks, Jesus Christ is real. Jesus still does miracles. Miracles. Jesus changed your life. And he's saying you can't see the forest for the trees. Verse 41, Then the men of Nineveh will rise up, and the judgment with this generation will condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, here it is, a greater than Jonah is here. He's just saying, man, you know the story. And, And we hadn't got there yet, but a whole town repented and realize that Jonah was a prophet, and that God could save them. I'm telling you, I am the Messiah. I'm standing in front of you, and you don't even get it. And here's the deal in the world that we live today. Let me tell you what's wrong with the world, and I know you know this. Folks, there's so many people that don't have Jesus. They just don't have Jesus. They have no moral compass. When you can walk into a church and just start shooting people, I mean, you are lost. You are doomed. You are gone. Okay? And and Jesus is the answer, folks. Jesus is the answer. And the bottom line to the story, and we will get to this next week, God wanted the people of Nineveh saved. He called Jonah. He told Jonah to go. Jonah rebelled, but yet, and next week we'll be talking about the God of second chances. The God of second chances. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. We'll close with this. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Bible says, whoop, wrong one. There we go. Well, let's look at verse 8. I know it's not up there, but let's look up for it. But beloved, do not forget this one thing. That with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. 
And we don't know the bottom line. We know he is coming, but we don't know when. Verse uh, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us. And here it is, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And we know not everyone's going to be saved. But we don't know who is going to be saved and who isn't. We don't know who the elect are and who isn't. And the reason Jesus hasn't come, because there's still people that need to be saved. And Jonah was so prejudiced. He was so biased in his uh, Assyrian and, and, and the enemies of Israel and these pagans and these Gentiles. I don't want to go to that city. I don't want to see them saved. They kicked our tails many times in battle. And God was saying, you are the man. I have chosen you. And the most important thing is, you go there and you preach my word. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I thank you that Jonah had a change of heart. And I know his back was against the wall. I truly believe there was a death sentence on him. But yet, God, he did the right thing. God, I thank you for the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord, that... uh, Uh, As Christians, we can have a change of heart. And God, I pray that we would just look at our own heart. And God, I pray also that we would look at the world. Lord, we live around people. We walk around people. We talk to people that literally have no clue of who Jesus is. And they really don't want to change because they haven't been told. And God, I pray that we would realize that... uh, We may not be a prophet, but we're a Christian. And the New Testament tells us that we need to go. We need to tell people about Jesus. You're waiting to see people saved. And really what it boils down to is we can can hasten your coming. The more people that get saved, folks, the closer we get to the rapture of the church. So God, I pray that, uh, Lord, when it comes to sin, we'll have a change of heart. And when it comes to fear and witnessing, we'll have a change of heart also. Your goal, your whole reason to sending Jesus was so people could be saved. So God, I pray that that would be on our hearts and in our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.